Welcome to Homeschool Mama Self Care. I'm Teresa Wiedrich at CapturingTheCharmLife.com. I'm here to help you turn your homeschool challenges into your homeschool charms. If you are a homeschool mama looking for a strategy or a few for your self care, then this is the podcast for you. Julie Bogart is the popular voice of common sense and compassion in the homeschool community. She's the creator of the innovative writing program called Brave Writer and the popular fast-growing practice called Poetry Tea Time. She's the founder of a homeschool coaching community called the Brave Learner Home. She home-educated her five children for 17 years who are now globe-trotting adults. Julie draws from her work with tens of thousands of homeschool families over the last 20 plus years and her own homeschool journey to enrich the homeschool and parenting experience. Her writing program includes award-winning online writing classes and paradigm-shifting writing manuals that allow parents and kids to become allies in the writing process. Julie is also the author of the best-selling book, The Brave Learner, and host of the popular podcast, A Brave Writer's Life in Brief. She enjoys raising African violets and playing with her brand new granddaughter, Julie lives in Cincinnati, Ohio. So true confession to all of my listeners, I actually started this podcast so I could have this hour chat with Julie. <laughs> and, and then I realized, actually, it's a natural extension of who I am. I want to encourage and empower homeschool moms. And I really do believe that if we're taking care of ourselves, we're going to be taking care of our kids. And if we want to do this long term, we definitely need to take care of ourselves. So I would love for everybody listening to hear a little bit about your story and where you first began homeschooling, a little bit about your kids and your story. Yeah, no problem. So I began homeschooling back in the 90s, early 90s, like 91, 92. Uh, I had lived in Morocco, a foreign country where a lot of the people we worked with were homeschooling. So that's how I first heard about homeschooling. I didn't know what it was, actually. The first time someone said those words together, I asked, what's that? Uh, but by the time my kids were school-aged, I was so blown away by the vision of it. I just loved that it could be personalized. I loved that I didn't have to send my kids away from me. I loved the thought of being the one to teach them to read, just like I had taught them to eat Cheerios and walk on their own. And so homeschooling for me became a natural extension of like my breastfeeding relationship and my attachment parenting style and just getting to be a participant in their growth and development. Yeah. Yeah, it is natural. And you've got five kids. You've done this for, was it 17 years? Before? Yeah, 17 years. So what's funny is people count differently. I started counting with my son at, um, at kindergarten age. Some people count from birth, but basically it was 17 years of academics. So kindergarten through, you know, senior high. I had a few kids who did some public high school I have one who did not like anything but homeschool. So I've had a variety of experiences, which is good. And they are all gainfully employed adults. I always think it's important to point that out. <laughs> and uh, they've been, four of them went to college. Two of them are one completed grad school. He was a Columbia Law student on scholarship. And then a daughter who's currently getting her master's in marriage and family therapy. And then I have three other kids and one of them, went to college three times and quit and then developed his own computer programming skills and is the father of my granddaughter. So favorite child points to him forever. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I sent, I sent one of my kids to high school for the first time ever. She's not even gone to kindergarten. And this wow. is the year we started her own school. <laughs> oh my goodness. During COVID, that's a really brave time. Yes, brave for sure. You are the author of The Brave Learner. You are the author of a series of books that I call really like seasonal homeschool devotions because mm. me and a whole bunch of other homeschool moms listen to um, our own homeschool mom read aloud every single morning as an encouragement from you. Awesome. Yeah. And every Saturday you send out, uh, I think you call it a missive with Julie. A, a tea yeah, tea with Julie. Exactly. Yes. Uh, super encouraging self-care strategies right there. But I would love to hear about what you've learned about self-care over the years as a homeschool mom, or maybe what your kids taught you. 
Yeah. Boy, so important. I think one of the dangers of being the kind of person who is attracted to homeschooling is that you're clearly a person who's willing to serve others and who gets a lot of joy out of seeing other people thrive. And the danger is to put your focus on those children to locate your joy and happiness in their performance or in their success. Uh, I was just having a chat with someone this morning, actually, who was explaining that it's frustrating to her that her kids don't show a passion or they make a careless comment like, boy, it'd really be great to fill in the blank, you know, be a pro baseball player or to be really good at microbiology. And then they just go back to playing their online games. And she said, you know, if they were truly passionate, it, they would pursue it. They would have this dogged pursuit. And I immediately realized this is what happens with homeschool. We locate our vision of success in our children, and then we get disappointed or we get overly hovering when they seem to be doing something we approve of. And really, the way to have a sort of stable life as a homeschooler is to not locate your joy and your success in your kids. Now, that sounds totally backwards, but it's actually true. I recommend all the time that parents pursue their own interests while they homeschool. So you need to have a passion. Don't worry so much about your kids having a passion. What animates you independent of your children? And it could be something as simple as learning to draw representationally. That was one of the very first interests I had when my kids were small. I did not want to believe the narrative that artists were only talented people. I was told that I could be taught to draw accurately, and I wanted to find out if that was true. So I got interested in drawing. Uh, later, I learned how to quilt. I became fascinated with making my own yogurt. In other words, they don't have to be like, I'm going to solve you know, the problem of climate change. I'm talking about things that are within your skill set and that take you out of, depending on your children's performance, for you to feel like a successful human being. Yeah. So sort of, awesome. yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Talk about awesome adulting. And yes, it's like finding your own identity outside of homeschool mom. I'm one of those moms that started as a young child. I wanted to be a mom. So then I thought that was the thing. And as I continued with this, I've discovered that the more that I have developed my own stuff, I am actually more comfortable with my kids developing their stuff. Yes. In fact, one of the benefits then is if you invest in one of your interests and you actually give it real time, not the fringes, not on the margins, not after everybody's in bed and you're depleted, but if you take time out of the middle of the day, right in front of your kids to pursue your passion, you're actually modeling to them what it looks like to go from idea, sort of curiosity, to implementation, which is never a straight line. It's a zigzag. You decide that you want to grow African violets and you kill the very first one. You yeah. decide you want to play the guitar and your fingers bleed. You decide that you want to make yogurt and it never congeals. These are things that your children will see you work through and they'll see your absolute delight when you're successful. Yeah. And this leaves room for them so that they're not living under your hovering expectation that they're developing a passion that will lead them to, to their career. This leaves them room to experiment just like you and to give sort of that little curious hunch a college try or you know maybe an elementary school try. <laughs> and I think that we miss the point of what an education is anyways when we try to focus on you know like learning outcomes or grades or tests or whatever or yes. Harvard or if you fill in the blank but we miss the point and the point is about life purpose. So if we have a sense of strong purpose in ourselves our kids will follow. You know it's actually true. I love that you brought up about the Ivy League because some people know this story but I'd love to share it with your listeners. So my son, Jacob, who's my middle child, he was the most self-motivated of all my kids, just naturally inclined to competition. So by the time he was in high school, he actually wanted to be in high school. So his freshman year, we had him take band and I think Spanish at the local high school part-time. By the end of that year, he really wanted to go full-time. So he took me out to dinner or actually invited me out to dinner. I ended up paying because that's how it works, right? <laughs> and he sat me down to tell me that he was disappointed that he had ever been homeschooled. And mm -hmm. I 
had to take it. You know, this is his real lived experience. As much as I wanted to defend my decision, I knew it was coming from somewhere. So I asked him, I said, what is this about? Why are you suddenly rejecting homeschool? He said, because I don't know where I stand in my peer group. I'm in band and I was really far behind. Of course, he went from last year to first year in a year because that's the kind of kid he is. He's like, I want to know if I'm smart and I'll only know that if I'm competing with these other kids. And then he said, and how will I ever get into an Ivy League college <laughs> now that I didn't do a full freshman year of high school? You know, you've hobbled me. I will be stuck with state universities. And of course, he went to a state university, he went to Ohio State, and he was in the honors program and was very successful there. But I really took it to heart. I thought, wow, I wonder if I have limited him. I wonder, you know, I didn't know we, we were going to find out. So by the time he finished high school, he was performing at a very high level. He even found a way to be the person who gave the commencement address, even without being valedictorian. I mean, that's the kind of kid he is. He went off to college, excelled there, earned all kinds of scholarships, led all kinds of groups. And then he earned these internships, one at the UN, first time an undergrad ever got the internship he got. He went to an internship at Princeton, Ivy League school, by the way. And I thought, oh, he's, he's leading his way there. Then he earned the loose scholarship and was in Thailand for a summer, or no, for a whole year, excuse me, working in the field of human rights. And during that year decided he wanted to be a human rights lawyer. So he dedicated himself to studying and he got into Columbia Law on a full ride scholarship, <laughs> Ivy League school. He also got accepted to Harvard. He turned Harvard down for <laughs> Columbia. And I'm like, so how did homeschooling hobble you again? <laughs> and interestingly, at every one of these points where he was interviewed for the schools, for law school, for any scholarship or internship, one of the key questions was about his homeschooling background. Mm. And so it sort of came full circle. And I was just talking to him this morning and his understanding now of how homeschooling has contributed to the education that he chose for himself is completely different at almost 30 than when he was 15. Yes. So I share that story just to give you some context that you're not hobbling your kids. If they want to go somewhere, they can get there. They will, especially yes. personality. I've got two of those kids. <laughs> oh man, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah, you're mostly just chasing them, right? They're just out in front of you and you're helping them get there. Yeah, and then actually as a homeschool mom, it's, we invest so much, we invest a lot of our lives that when our child says, I want to go to school, we're like, uh, what? But I'm a homeschool right. mom. <laughs> yeah, that's been a challenge. This is the second child that I've actually seen go into high school. So it's been an interesting um, learning curve for me personally. And that is probably what parenting and homeschooling has been more than anything. When people ask yes. about homeschool and they say, but what about socialization? I try to mildly roll my, eye, my eyes, um, <laughs> except for the last few months. Now I get it. But um, in lockdown, I mean, but when it comes yes. to academics, I'm not concerned at all, but it's about how to be a parent or how to be a human, how to be a kind human, how to be yes. you know, having all the stuff that we have inside of us that we have to deal with. We will find all of the keys to finding it when we're a parent and definitely for homeschooling parent. Absolutely. And in fact, you know, the fact that I launched a business and wrote books and did things, went to grad school while I was homeschooling, all contributed to who my kids have become. I have a daughter who is an, you know, self-starting entrepreneur as a life coach living in Mexico. I have a son who, my oldest, who went to college three times and quit until he decided, you know what, I really have never been about traditional learning. I'm going to teach myself the skills I need to be a happy adult. And isn't that what we really want? We want our kids to choose a path, not to have the path chosen for them. We want them to trust in their own abilities to get to the places they want to go. Johanna was actually accepted into grad school twice at UC Berkeley for social work and turned it down twice. She suddenly realized that her joy in life coaching was what she really wanted to pursue, and she sort of lost faith in the social work system. These are all brave choices that I think would have been hard for me to make at their ages. Oh, but yeah. they've kind of grown up with this iconoclastic mother and this idea of not 
abiding by the system just for the sake of abiding by it. And so they have more internal permission to even as adults choose differently for themselves. And I think that's really one of the goals. A hundred percent. And it's beautiful to watch it. It's also, I wonder if we choose certain things that are not very typical because we're trying to grow ourselves. Yes. And we go through that process. We watch our child do it. We actually learn from them. I mean, my oldest is 19 and I have, I honestly, I don't know if there's a child that equals the things that I've learned from that one right from day two. I can look all the way back and the things that I continue to learn from her, I marvel. Yes, absolutely. And that's, you know, you started with the question about self-care and I think pursuing our passions is a big piece of that because our, our need to be fulfilled as adults is real. We, if we treat adulthood like we're putting a pause button until our children are raised, you're literally taking the lion's share of your adulthood and putting it on hold when you just spent your entire childhood preparing to be an adult. Yes. And that can feel very um, deflating, you yeah. know, disempowering. So I always say, keep your foot in the door. Whether you work an actual for money kind of job, you know, whether you've got a side gig that pays you or not, keeping that fire alive in you also helps you fulfill the dream your parents had for you when they were raising you, which is how are you going to contribute to this project of humankind? Not just who are you raising, but who are you raised to be? And it takes time. It means saying things like, you know what? I want to be a writer. So every Monday night, this is what I did. I went to the library and left the kids with my husband and I would spend time researching magazines to write for, perfecting my craft, figuring out what I wanted to do next. And that was just once a week, three little hours a week, but it gave me a way to feel like the Julie that I am. And there, I'll be honest, we would meet, I would meet in these little um, cubicles that they had that were like these almost soundproof rooms in the library. And there were a few times I just slept on the floor. (laughs) There were a couple of times I got there and I was so overwhelmed and distressed with my life that I cried and journaled. So giving yourself the freedom to be a complete human being who has real needs, real feelings, real aspirations while you homeschool, that's what self-care is. So Wednesday was my day, three hours Starbucks with a pumpkin spice latte and a scone. Yeah. Perfect. I love it. I think by the time I got to my third or fourth child, though, I had to pursue my own interests or my own identity, partly because I was just bored, silly, rereading first language lessons again. And I love Susan yes. Bauer's book, but I mean, four times, it's, it's getting old now. So we have to find something to do. That's absolutely right. And remember, homeschooling is your big project. It's not your kids. Your kids just live in your house. They're sort of constrained to whatever you decide for them. So they're not seeing homeschool as the risk-taking adventure that you see it as. They're like, I live here. I've seen all these four walls many times, right? So keeping yourself engaged on their behalf is really important. And I've often said that you can switch curriculums just because you're bored. Like that is a valid reason because keeping you interested is how you spark interest for your kids. Yeah, and I always tell everybody just follow your follow your child, even though it's yes. a very messy process. But which usually means you should probably spend less money on curriculum, almost always. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> say um, unexpected challenges have been along the way in your homeschool. So one of the first uh, unexpected ones is I thought that if I had a really ship shaped schedule, everybody would be happier. So I, one year when my son was in fourth grade and my daughter was in second and I had a kindergartner and I had a baby, you know, like always, I was always pregnant or nursing somebody. I decided to really get out the planner and I had one for my oldest and one for my next oldest. And I wrote out every subject, all the days of the week. I used highlighters that they could use to cross off when they finished their work. I wrote margin love notes and gave them (laughs) stickers. I mean, I was trying really hard to do it in the lovingest way possible. And my daughter thrived. She thought this was brilliant. She loves knowing what's coming. But one day about three months in, I went to wake up Noah, my oldest. And when he woke up, he said, I hate my life. (laughs) He didn't just say, I hate the schedule. His whole life had been ruined. It was a moment for me. I was deeply distressed that I was causing my child to hate his existence. 
So I sort of went back to the drawing board and I met with an educational specialist that I had worked with at the time in the um, independent study program in California. And she gave me an article that was about brain research and how brains learn in clusters and chunks, not by divvying up the day over each subject, you know, 20 or 30 minutes at a time. And it suddenly dawned on me that that was how Noah behaved when I left him alone And that it was also the way I behaved when I was an adult left alone without a school system. And so we made this shift to sort of almost like, well, a little bit like unschooling, but also sort of block learning. So I remember, yes. So I remember he was, we were in California. It was time to do California history. He showed some interest in the gold rush. So we decided to throw a huge theme gold rush party. And we spent six weeks planning it. Uh, we we gathered fool's gold. We created a sluice. We made a big panning for gold site. We invited all his friends. We wrote invitations. We played pin the gold nugget on Sutter's Creek. He drew a big map. You know, we had all these ways of engaging history. And it suddenly swept us into learning in a way that just following a schedule and textbooks were not accomplishing. So that would be my first really big aha moment was, Mm -hmm. oh, there are ways to do this that don't kill his little spirit. And it brings you so much more freedom and it gives you a sense of like a perspective, but then you feel like, okay, I can relax and not have to worry or doubt or feel overwhelmed by your entirely unrealistic schedule, right? Oh, a hundred percent. And honestly, I was getting tired. I mean, it's really hard to beat that drum every day. And Once the internet opened up, um, I discovered blogging for myself personally, but what I started doing is I created a private blog. I still have it. It's secret. No one's ever seen it but me, but I would log about once a month what we had done in a single day. So I would try to just narrate a day. I knew if I tried to capture the whole month, I'd end up putting a burden on myself. So I tried to pick a single day in a month. And just describe what happened from dawn until bedtime, including things like the toddler telling me about the three little pigs in a bathtub or discussing cavities on the way to the dentist or, you know, helping me make muffins for poetry tea time. And what I discovered is if I did that once a month, I was never worried. The evidence of learning was so powerful in my children that I could see the continuity over a series of months. And when I go back and read them now, it is like a time capsule. I am amazed at the things we were doing that I have completely forgotten about Mm -hmm. if I hadn't written them down. So that was sort of my narrative sketch that I would do monthly. And to capture what was going on, I did something I call planning from behind. At the end of a day, I would just jot down in my calendar all the stuff we got done instead of the stuff we were planning to do. And that was also really empowering. I started valuing spontaneous learning over planned learning, which was great. Yeah, totally. Me too. I actually, I I was doing that before I heard you describe it, but I'm like, yeah, that's what I do. And I do it not because I'm bound to the province because the province I live in doesn't actually have learning outcomes for me as a registered homeschooler. Wow. Wow. I know it's so much freedom. Um, There's very few people taking that freedom, but we have that opportunity, but I write it down. And when I look back, I go, wow, we were touching all sorts of things. So it's a bit of a busy work because I'm doing it myself, but it gives me perspective, just like you said. And, you know, to the radical unschooler, I don't look like I'm an unschooler. (laughs) Right. I'm like, how can I get my son's interest in Harry Potter's Latin spells to translate into looking at the derivatives of these words? Yes. No, I'm not an unschooler, but I I like to exactly like you. If they love something, I'm on it. Well, and honestly, I think the best unschoolers do do those things. They're just so afraid of people systematizing that sometimes the impression they leave is that they're very hands-off. But the most skillful unschoolers I know were all in. They were constantly strewing things in the path of their children to make learning more exciting, more interesting, more possible. Where I think we sometimes go wrong in whether it's unschooling or traditional schooling is that we believe the system saves us. So we might believe the philosophy of unschooling saves us. I thought that for several years, but it doesn't. What saves us is responsiveness. And what unschoolers contend for 
is a profound responsiveness. They actually really believe in that. And I would say for me personally, it was some sort of combination of attentiveness and openness and some planning for things that I just did not feel that skill set in. So for instance, I could be very unschooly with literature and history. Those are like second nature to me. For math, we never got there. Uh, We ended up using not only curriculum, but I used to swap lessons with a friend. I would teach her kids writing. She'd teach my math. Uh, I hired a tutor in high school. So there were times where I really relied on resources outside myself when I felt that failure of skill or imagination. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And that's the beauty of really, it's like a community-based um, home education. It's not really. Yes. The yes. risk ones are including everything, I think. What would you say um, a myth of homeschool mama self-care is? Something that you see people believing that's not really true. So one of the issues with self-care is that it can sound like, you know, bath salts and tea. And so if you are truly in crisis, just taking a bath isn't going to fix things for you. So self-care to me is also about your psychological hygiene. How healthy are you? What environment do you live in? Are you in an environment that keeps you stressed? Are you in an environment that allows you space and grace to grow? Uh, One of the biggest hindrances in my own development as a person was being in communities or organizations that were too ideologically rigid. And so whenever I would start to pivot or get a new thought or ask a question, I was risking membership. And a lot of times I wasn't just risking mine, I was risking my children's. And those pressures undermine your well-being far more than busyness, schedules, a child who can't read, because your community is what gives you support in life. And if the community starts to feel like a threat or that you have to pretend or hide who you are to be a member that will have a long-term detriment to your mental health. So if we're looking at self-care, I think it's very important to ask yourself, where is the stress coming from? Is it that I'm not showing up as, I, as who I really am around certain people? Is it from my marriage where I'm not allowed to bloom and be who I am? Is it from my in-laws or my parents who are judging me for homeschooling? Find out the source of your distress and locate a community that will give you the ballast to keep going, that will validate your very real and necessary concerns, that will not require you to live up to their fantasy or their ideal in order to participate. Yeah. Um, And like you, when you're talking about similar um, ideological backgrounds, I very much felt as a homeschool mom that I would find my homogenous homeschool community. And what I've come to understand is if I'm going to be authentic and if I'm going to be vulnerable, then I'm going to just simply have to find individuals that are also authentic and vulnerable and build my community based on that rather than a specific community. Not, I mean, everybody to each their own, but I found similar to you that I was not being really true to who I was when I was trying to follow a specific community. Understood. And honestly, I was a part of a co-op where I did not fully align with all of their beliefs, but that was okay. I taught, I taught um, theater, I taught writing, my kids participated. I protected their right to have those beliefs. I did not contradict them or treat their students in a different way or treat the moms in a different way because we weren't ideologically aligned. But that was not where I went for my primary source of friendship or my primary source of companionship on my own journey, whatever that was. I mean, I wound up divorced. That is not looked on well in most homeschooling circles. So my homeschooling friends were not my primary support during that period of my life. So those are the kinds of things I think is very important to have sort of a broad um, toolkit, you know, some passions, some spice lattes, pumpkin spice lattes alone, uh, some time with your significant other if it's mutually beneficial, some time with your posse, you know, those women who really are in it for the long haul with you, no matter how you show up, who remember who you were, who you are today, and who are willing for you to be who you'll be tomorrow without requiring you to be someone else. If you have those pieces in place, Of course, exercise is important, sleep is important, eating well is important. But if you have those broader pieces in place, you can homeschool pretty successfully for the long haul. 
I think we have a very non-homogenous homeschool community now because there are a lot of people that have joined the community. Yes. I mean, and welcome to everybody. We are all doing our own thing. We're learning about this in a different way. We're all unique individuals. All of our kids are unique individuals. So nobody's homeschooling the same. But um, what would you say as advice for new homeschool parents? Yeah, so the biggest advice I give to every new homeschool parent is that you are bringing learning into a home, not a school. So the building that your children went to if they were in school before or the one you thought about sending them to, it is designed to create certain behaviors and a certain authority structure that enables it to do the good job that it does to teach your children, to make sure that they move along at the pace that the school expects. It is a designed space. And your children, if they go to it or have been to it, or if you remember your own experience, you gear up to go there. While you're on the bus, you're thinking about the person you'll be. You know you have to go to your locker. You know you need certain books at a certain time of day. You know that you need a hall pass to pee. You know that you have to raise your hand to speak. This is not a relaxing space. No matter how many comfy couches they add to the classroom, you still need permission to do pretty much anything in that classroom space. And the learning is guided and directed by a teacher. You can't say, you know, I know fractions are on the schedule for today, but I'm much more interested in geometric shapes. That is not how it works. So school is very structured and kids become a student within that structure. When you bring learning home, you are bringing learning into a space where the child's deepest sensibility about that building is they get to be themselves. Mm -hmm. They get to be themselves. They can flop on the couch. They can go get a snack when they're hungry. They can use the bathroom without asking your permission. They can be a little bit ornery and cranky when they wake up in the morning and they'll still be loved. They're not punished for, you know, very random comments they make in the middle of you explaining something. The, the home environment caters to the individual. So when we try to put this sort of impersonal system as an overlay, kids naturally rebel. They get crankier. They kick the chair legs. They get up when they quote unquote weren't supposed to. They ask you why they have to do this meaningless thing. All of that points to how deeply felt their individuality is when they live in this space. And don't we want that? Those are the nurtured bonds of family. So what I tell new homeschoolers is this. Use the properties of home to guide the learning. So what does that look like? Well, at our house, when our kids were doing handwriting practice, we lit candles. I don't know why that helped. It just did. They liked lighting them. They liked running their fingers through them. They liked blowing them out. And for some reason, if a candle was lit, they were more willing to do their handwriting. Mm. When we were doing poetry, I added a tea time experience. So they had tea and we had muffins and we would read poetry. We would set the table. They would gather things from the backyard to create a centerpiece. Somehow that little extra made reading poetry really special. When we would do math, sometimes I would do it with them as a partner, collaborating, talking through the problems because math by itself is kind of boring for a lot of kids. But if they have a companion, they're more willing to do it. Sometimes just putting a snack on the table that they can fish, you know, peanuts and raisins out of a bowl while they're doing their, you know, handwriting. Or maybe you tuck them into the corner of the sectional and you give them a clipboard and you let them pet the cat and do their writing assignment on the clipboard while cozy in a blanket on the sectional. If you yield to the properties of home, learning will flourish. If you fight the properties of home, you likely lose the learning as well. It becomes this standoff around school standards and you lose the opportunity to learn something. Yeah, so true. Boy, I I have so many thoughts when you say that. First of all, what you just said is just a very well-articulated way to say something that I've said in a much shorter way because I can't I can't say everything that you said I haven't learned everything that you said but I'm like wow that is amazing the second thing is it's funny when our kids get to be about teenagers or 14 15 then they also identify that hey I am an individual so then sometimes they want to go to school or do something different but then right 
Yeah, that doesn't necessarily pertain to all the new homeschoolers that have young kids, though. But for the new homeschoolers, I genuinely believe that if someone wants to do it and if they're literate, because it'll be a definite challenge if they're not, but they still can figure it out. If they're literate and have a library card, they can do it. Uh, it, that is 100% true. And honestly, even for friends, I had a friend in California who is a Latina background. So she was fluent in Spanish, fluish, fluent in English, but her school really dropped the ball and she never felt comfortable in handwriting, in writing either of them. She didn't really know punctuation. She felt unskillful in grammar. And here she was trying to teach her five kids. Mm -hmm. And at one point she came to me and said, I'm, I'm really failing. And so when when you feel like you're failing, what do you do for your kids? You overdo it. She bought the hardest grammar textbooks, the most challenging punctuation programs, because she assumed that would make up for her deficit. In the meantime, her kids were suffering and there became war in their family over grammar. So I said to her, you know, Lanka, you're smart. You could actually learn this stuff. Why don't you take a year off of teaching it to your kids and hire a tutor for yourself? Just become skillful in English and just give yourself the joy of confidence instead of waiting for your kids to get it while you wring your hands and are worried that you don't know if they're doing it right. That's exactly what she did. She got a tutor for her. They took the year off of working on grammar and punctuation, just read aloud. And a year later, because she's a mature woman in her 30s who can learn very quickly, who is 100% fluent in English, she knew what she needed to know mm -hmm. and went back to teaching and had all this confidence. So literally as a home educator, you can learn, you can become the person that you want to be that helps your kids grow and there's nothing stopping you and there's nothing more empowering than filling in your own gaps. Oh, and there were a couple for me. Yes, me too. Especially around math, which I Same. Heard, yeah, even double digit <laughs> subtraction. Yes, I acknowledge Yes, <laughs> I couldn't even remember how to divide fractions and I was in my thirties. I had to learn it from scratch. I mean- you know, for all of those parents who are worried about gaps, hello, I went to public school. I have a degree from UCLA and I couldn't remember how to divide fractions at age 35. So yes. there are going to be gaps. <laughs> yes. And I did pediatric dosing as a nurse and I'm not bragging oh. about this, but, and I should have known how to do some basic calculations without a calculator. Apparently now they require you to have a calculator, but you can learn whatever you need to learn oh. when you need to learn it. Yes, Absolutely. I'm assuming that you probably have a word or two that might define um, how you approach your days or how you might approach your business or how you um, approach your homeschool coaching. Do you want to share that with us or are you able to share that with us? Sure. Um, so I live alone, which makes my life so much less complicated than when I had seven people in it. So uh, I can pretty much do what I want. I think the main thing that works for me is I tend to spend time each day getting a feel for what's happening in the world of homeschooling. I read Facebook pages. I read Instagram accounts. I try to get a sense of what is the zeitgeist and what are the needs and what are people feeling? And I get a lot of interaction with my community. So I'm deeply grateful for that. I do spend time writing pretty much every day uh, from scratch for some purpose. I'm working on a book currently about critical thinking in children. So that gets some research time every day. But for my own pleasure, I walk usually. I used to be a runner, but I broke my ankle several years ago. And so now I'm more of a walker. Uh, but I try to walk three hours a day. And I use that time to listen to podcasts or a book on Audible. Right now I'm listening to Beloved by Toni Morrison. I can't believe I've never read it. Beautiful. It is staggeringly beautiful. It is such a, a gift. And I feel so privileged to be on the receiving end of such powerful prose. Uh, I do have a man in my life. So we watch a lot of sports because we're both huge sports fans. So, and I still drink tea pretty religiously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if I remember tips no is that right from from london oh, oh pg tips oh the name of my yeah. team yes pg tips that's, that's exactly how right. man girling i am girlfriend yes that's very good good for you yeah, yeah actually i learned about um tea i became interested in it during my first pregnancy my midwife in morocco was british and after my very first prenatal appointment, she's like, would you like a cup of tea? And I looked at her and I said, Anne, I can't drink tea. I'm pregnant. It has caffeine in it. And now I'm about to butcher her accent, but this is what she said back. She said, 
Julie, do you really think that British women give up tea just because they're pregnant? <laughs> like, oh my gosh. She's like, the little bit of caffeine will not harm you or the baby. And then I got suckered into it for the rest of my life. So I'm a big tea drinker. <laughs> and, yeah, you are. And you've encouraged everybody else to drink tea. I think it's a little passage for homeschooled kids to drink tea when they're in their single digits. It's so, so funny. I don't know. People drink coffee all over the world and tea all over the world at all ages. I think Americans, maybe North Americans, are the only culture that are worried about it. <laughs> yeah, we drink a lot of tea. And I won't tell you that I might have started a homeschool sommelier program for <laughs> I've had <all> my kids. <laughs> oh my god, I love that. That's Not amazing. Officially. One of them is very good at telling me the the uh, smells or the 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 tasting notes. <laughs> That's amazing. I would love to hear three things that you would love to be known for or that you'd like to include wow. as part of your legacy. Oh my gosh, that is that is a question I've never been asked. Um, I would, let's see, on the fly. I think in terms of my work in the field of writing, what I would like to be known for is the priority of actually hearing the voice of the student, that making it a priority to actually listen to the content and not be so fixated on the mechanics that we ellipses out the most important part of the writing, which is the communication. That if we could value that first, it would shift everything about how we teach writing and how we think about the student. So I would love to have that go down as a, a writing legacy. In terms of homeschooling, I think I would like to be known for, certainly we prioritize the connection with the child, but I think what is a little bit unique about my work and about the Brave Learner is that when you look at the picture on the cover, you see a small child and everyone assumes that the brave learner is the child. But my work has been with the parent. And to me, the parent is the brave learner. It takes an enormous amount of courage to take on the task of educating your children. And I would like the memory to be that I was on the side of that parent, that the parent understood that I knew the scale of that task and we came up with a plan together to do it from a point of sanity and effectiveness that also nourishes and takes care of that parent. That is, you know, well, then you have fulfilled it because what you just said is exactly what we know of you. Oh, thank you. We thank are you. thankful that you are rooting for us. I am 100%. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm guessing that you have had the experience of discouragement or that sense of overwhelm or that sense of doubt or what the heck am I doing? <laughs> oh, oh, who doesn't? And in fact, that's what builds your stamina. You know, I, um, before I broke my ankle, I was a marathon runner and people talk all the time about marathoning, even when you've never done it. So I'm going to use this analogy anyway. But one of the things that happens in running is that you get to these moments where you're really discouraged, but the thing that keeps you going, the thing that keeps you running past your exhaustion, past the pain point, past the feeling that you cannot do it is the belief that other people have done it, that they've actually done it, that 26.2 miles is not impossible because thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people thought that was a good idea at some point. <laughs> and so you kind of remind yourself, okay, I'm really suffering right now, but other people have done it, so I must be able to, to be able to as well. That was the same for me with being an entrepreneur. Every time I hit a wall where I didn't know, I'd think, but other people have solved this problem. It must be doable. And that is literally the message I want to leave for homeschoolers, that it must be possible because thousands have come before you. Millions have come before you now. And so whenever you hit that wall of discouragement, just know everyone has hit it and we are all problem solving it together. And it is possible to overcome. There's no problem that is too great to be overcome in homeschooling. Mm -hmm. And so many encouragers out there, like for the yes. tsunami wave of new homeschoolers that have come um, or have joined us, uh, there are so many veteran homeschoolers online that are trying to encourage others that you can do this. But you have recently developed a new um, coaching home or Brave yes. Learner home for encouragement for everybody. Would you share about that? Yes, uh, the Brave Learner Home is a coaching and mentorship space 
for home educators. We started it actually under a different name about six years ago, and it has thousands of people in it now. It's a really lovely space. It is completely non-sectarian, so it's not driven by any particular ideology. You can homeschool in any way you want. We even have some public and private school parents in there because really what we're about is parents facilitating education. So we invite guest speakers each month or I speak. We do training for Brave Writer products. We have a, a lesson plan that is on an extracurricular topic every month that has different challenge levels. So it's just ready-made. So if you're, you know, pregnant nursing or at the end stages of, uh, you know, the baby moon, or maybe you're just really overwhelmed or you're suffering from COVID, we've got stuff you can just do that you don't have to think about. And then there's just this rich archive of topics, everything from parenting and self-care to actual school subjects, executive function, brain-based learning, the whole nine yards. We have a trained staff that coaches, so it's not just me and a bunch of you. It's, you know, I think we have six different people in there offering support and advice, so. Beautiful. Yeah, beautiful. There's a lot of people out there right now. I would love to hear your thoughts, um, the things that you learned through your kids, which I find are many, but the things that you've learned about yourself or the things that you needed to learn about yourself to become that awesome adult, can you give me... Um, an idea of what you think one of the major themes is in that? Yeah. Oh my goodness. I think trusting the process, you know, I had these certain outcomes in mind. I think we all do. Conscientious parents do. I wanted all my kids to go to college. I wanted them all to have a clear passion. I wanted them to be successful adults who doesn't want that. But what I noticed is that as we got closer and closer to the end of the story, I became more and more fixated on what I thought that would look like. And it became very apparent to me as I had five kids, so I had five chances to get better at it, right? Uh, and what became more and more apparent to me is that the process is the goal. The goal isn't the goal. Right. The goal isn't the goal. The process is the goal. So my fourth child, I discovered, oh, we're in junior high. He still doesn't seem interested in academics. We're going to just take an extra year before we start high school. So he did four years instead of three years of junior high. When he finished high school, he took a whole year off and went traveling before he started college. With my oldest, I was not nearly that flexible, even though he required me to be. I was just more of a meanie about it. You know, I would say things that I really regret now yes. if I had only known to just yeah. trust the process. Yeah. And that's what I learned by the fourth child. So to me, um, believing the best about your kids, that they want to grow up to be successful, that they don't want to live in your basement forever, that they, that even the ones who are passionate gamers, and I know this is what comes back to me all the time, they know what an adult is. They see you and their other parent all the time. So quit assuming that they're naive, that eventually they'll be paying a bill. They know that. Part of the reason they're gaming so passionately is they see those embers of childhood fading. And they're trying to squeeze it all in before they really do have to go out the door. So trusting the process, I think, would be the key. And so what I've heard, like maybe the subtext, is that you have to have at least four children. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the good news is for those of you with one or two kids, maybe you're not as depleted. So maybe you learn it better because you can really just focus on two. Whereas I was spread kind of thin and uh, that might've made me a little more desperate. So anyway, we're all learning. And if I can pass that on a little bit, hopefully it'll spare some kids of that pressure. Gotta hope. <laughs> Gotta hope. I want to pose a few, uh, three fun questions to wrap up our interview today. What is an identity that you have that is entirely outside your homeschool mom or your homeschool coach identity that we don't all know about? Oh, what a fun question. Hmm. I'm trying to think of one that you don't know about. I guess I would say that one of the passions I have, but I'm not very active in it, is I love being on the water. So I love kayaking. But I live in Ohio, and my favorite kayaking has been in the ocean. But we are, I finally have a kayak, so I'm just starting to do it in Ohio. 
But yeah, if I can, I love the beach. I love the ocean. I discovered Michigan, Lake Michigan. I'm like, what? I live four hours from this. I had no idea. So yes, bodies of water. That would be an identity that I have. You're always welcome to join here because we have a river right beside us. That's perfect. I normally ask, what are you doing on Friday night? But I kind of want to know what you're going to be doing on Tuesday nights at 8, October 13th. Why? <laughs> <laughs> the Bachelorette starts. <laughs> oh, I definitely will be watching that. Oh my God, that's so funny that I didn't even catch where you were headed. Oh yeah, no, I definitely love the Bachelor franchise for all the wrong reasons. Yeah, <laughs> all of them. I would be absolutely <laughs> mortified if any of my children dated 25 people at one time. But I, I, don't know. I, bet I can't not watch. Pass the popcorn, please. My <laughs> daughters and I love to dissect it. It's awesome. Me too. I, yeah, I love it. Would you prefer Rosé or a Malbec? So interestingly, I don't really drink anymore. Um, that just interferes with my sleep since I hit my 50s. But, if, but back when I had wine, Malbec over Rosé every day of the week. Yeah, amen. <laughs> it was a real pleasure having you today. I enjoyed it very much. Fangirl all over. Well, Teresa, this was delightful. Those were some of the best questions I've ever had. I really enjoyed being on this podcast. Well, great. Come back and I'll ask you some more. <laughs> okay. Have a great day. Awesome. You too. Thank you for joining me today. I'd love to hear more about who you are, so come on over to my Facebook or Instagram page, Homeschool Mama Self Care. My goal is to equip you with self care strategies to help you turn your homeschool challenges into your homeschool charms. If you want to learn more about my course, How to Homeschool 101, or my upcoming book, Homeschool Mama Self Care Thrive Not Just Survive, head over to my blog www.capturingthecharmlife.com. You'll also find the show notes and links to everything you've heard in this episode. I hope you and your kids have a charmed week. And until next time, I hope you can turn your challenges into your charms.